Well, welcome. I'm glad you're here with us this morning. It is great to see you. Uh, and I had a couple conversations this last week um, about the word imitation, right? So when you hear the word imitation, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? A positive connotation or a negative connotation? Most people will say it's, it's negative, right? Imitation, knockoff, sort of uh, lesser wannabe sort of products. Uh, I remember when we lived in Chicago, uh, going to Bible college out there, I would ride the train, I'd walk throughout the city, and oftentimes found lots of imitation products for sale. So nice Rolexes for $15, um, purses and shoes and, and so on. You name it, you can get kind of an imitation version, which isn't really the real thing, right? It's something lesser. It's, it's for those who can't afford the Rolex watches. You get the imitation one. Likewise, when uh, Professor McNay and I were in uh, Ukraine last year teaching at a Bible college, we went to the supermarket, and they had all sorts of imitation products, right? They had Starbucks that was spelt differently. They had Pepsi that was spelt differently. They had Heinz ketchup that was different. There was all of these imitation products to try to be like the original, right? Uh, Imitation is out there constantly. When we were first married, I bought a pair of imitation Michael Jordan basketball shoes, all excited because I couldn't afford the authentic ones, so I contacted this distributor in China. I got them for a drastically discounted price. They finally came in the mail. I was so excited to put them on, and as soon as I picked them up out of the box, I said, oh, these don't even feel right. And I put them on, and it was within five minutes. I could barely walk. Those things hurt my feet so bad. Needless to say, even the 50 bucks that I spent on them was a waste of money. That imitation product was lacking significantly. However, imitation isn't always a bad thing. When we hear this word to imitate or imitation, it it does connote this idea of not as good knockoff sort of uh, brands or products. However, there is a positive side to imitation as well. In fact, imitation is necessary for our lives. Who here has heard the saying, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, right? Imitation is the sincerest uh, form of flattery. George Bernard Shaw, the Scottish playwright, actually went a little bit further when he said, imitation is not just the sincerest form of flatter, it's the sincerest form of learning. It's not only the sincerest form of flattery, but it is also the most sincerest form of learning. To learn something is a far greater task than just understanding it cognitively, right? We can understand a process of something and say we've learned it, but not until we actually embody what we have learned can we really say we have mastered or learned something. Um, I used to work in construction, and this was very evident in the construction world with people would come onto a construction site having all of the degrees and and so on and try to say this needs to be done this way but have never actually done it. They know something, but they haven't really learned how the process works. To learn something is to imitate, to follow, to look to somebody who knows how to do it and learn how to be this sort of worker, this sort of man, this sort of woman. If you think about parenting, parenting is all imitation. Right? If, if you are a parent, then you have imitated your parents in parenting or another set of parents that you've looked at and said, okay, this is how we do it. Right? You can read all the parenting books in the world, but until you actually get your hands on those kids and you start understanding what it is to, to parent, it's a different experience. So you want to look to people who can show you how to parent well. Not only do you imitate as parents, but your kids are imitating you. Right? This happens all the time. No matter what, when your kids look to you, they are imitating you. Mandy and I were, were out a while ago, and she, she pointed when we were in Colorado of this father and son that were walking down the street, both with one hand in a pocket, both with the arm swinging, and looking the exact same way, right? The son learned to even walk like his father, right? Kids look to their 
mothers and their fathers to learn how to think, to learn how to grow, to learn how to work. When we were in seminary, I was working construction, and Owen was two and a half at the time, and my schedule was such that we had a hard time getting time together with classes and homework and work and so on. So I was doing this project uh, at a house, and Owen really wanted to come with me. I said, yeah, absolutely, you can come with me. So I've got a picture here, you can put it up, of Owen getting ready, and he put on his boots, and he put my, I put my boots on, and this was, this was his day. He wanted to imitate his dad, right? He wanted to wear the right boots, and we went and we worked, and I was proud of him. He did great. But Owen learns to work by imitating his parents. Our kids learn their sense of humor by imitating their parents. Our kids learn to walk with God by imitating their parents. What a powerful, powerful truth for us that our kids learn to walk with God by imitating their parents. Parents, we have a huge responsibility to demonstrate to our kids what it looks like to walk with God because they are imitating you. They grow and they mature by imitating their parents. In fact, the whole process of maturation is one of imitation. I grow, I aspire, I want to be like someone who is more mature. Discipleship itself is imitation. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, he says this, he says, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. Right? Be imitators of me, he says. I have learned Christ. I have walked with Christ. I have become your spiritual father. Imitate me. Do as I do as I follow Christ. Can we say that to those in the church? Ladies, can you look at younger ladies and say, I'm, I'm happy to be your spiritual mother. I will disciple you. You just watch me how I live my life, and you will live like Christ, including how to repent well and how to say I'm sorry and how to confess sins. Men, do we have young men in the church that we're saying, follow me, watch me. I will show you what it looks like to live like Christ. Imitate me. Paul urges the Corinthian Christians to do just that, to imitate him as he is their father in the faith. So the big question we need to ask ourselves is not whether or not we are imitators, because we all are. This is how God has made us. The question is, who are we imitating? Who is it that we are imitating? Look with me at Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to be in verses 1 through 21. Ephesians 5, 1 through 21. And Paul begins this whole section by calling these people to imitate, to imitate God. Be imitators of God as beloved children. He then goes through the rest of this section and he unpacks what this means. He talks about walking as children of light not in darkness, of walking with wisdom, not as unwise, to live in a way that is glorifying to God, having your life be like a, a fragrant offering going up. He fleshes out for us what it looks like to imitate God. So Ephesians 5.1 says this, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And this makes perfect sense. Children are to imitate their fathers. Children are to imitate their parents. And Paul is telling us to imitate God, be imitators of God as beloved children. He is not telling us to imitate God as some far-off servant that's impersonal, and you just look at God as being perfectly holy, just, righteous, and good, and just figure out how to do that. Right? He, he's not saying that. He's not saying you're a servant and you must obey. You must imitate God in this way. That's not how he phrases it. Nor does he say it in such a way that makes this an obligation. This is not an obligation to imitate God. He's not saying, well, if you're really a good Christian, if you're really a righteous Christian, if you take your serious faith, or if you take your faith serious, uh, you will imitate God. That's not what he says. 
What does he say? Look at the verse. Be imitators of God as beloved children. This is our posture as we imitate God, as beloved children. Not employees that are going to be in trouble if we don't imitate him just right or live out this job description just right. No, we imitate God as beloved children. We also don't imitate God to become beloved children. He doesn't say that. Right? The foundation is we are beloved children, therefore imitate God. What a beautiful verse for us that we know at the very beginning, who am I? I am a child. I'm not just a child of God, but I may be loved. Agape toss is the word. Agape love. Unconditionally loved by God. And as such, I want to be like him. I want to imitate him. We are to imitate God as a child imitates his father or mother. And as we imitate God, we love the things that God loves. We hate the things that God hates. Kenora, uh, uh, Van Til, who was a great theologian and philosopher of the 19th century, he wrote that one of the chief priorities for Christians who love God is to think God's thoughts after him, right? We are to think God's thoughts after him. And this is a great concept because it highlights the reality that everything that goes on in your life, everything you see on the news, everything you listen to, God has already thought through that, right? God already has processed that. God already knows what is true and good and beautiful about it, and he also knows what is wrong and filthy and immoral that should be done away with. God knows all things and all situations. So as followers of God, we are to think God's thoughts after him. We are as children to imitate God in his thinking about life. So if you're at work and you're in conflict with one of your coworkers, you want to say, what? What is God thinking about this situation? And that's what I should be thinking. I should be imitating God. I should be thinking his thoughts after him. If we have family strife and it's difficult to figure out, and there's family tension and there's good and bad on both sides and we're confused and we don't know what to do, we go to God. God, what? What do you think about this? And we do that by going to his word, going to him in prayer, going to our community and sharing and saying, what do you think God is saying about this? And going back to the authority, which is God's word, we then begin to form our thoughts about the situation according to God's thoughts about the situation. We are to think God's thoughts after him. And as we do this, our minds become conformed to Christ Our affections become conformed to Christ, and we live our lives loving God. As we are beloved by him, as we are formed into him, we then love him better. We love him because he first loved us, right? Our children love parents, their parents, because their parents first loved them. This is something that they grow to understand. They grow in this love. And we likewise grow in our love for God. Romans 5.5 5 says that God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. God has poured his love into our hearts. We, therefore, to imitate him well, we take that love that he has poured into us and we pour it into the world, into every situation. We seek to love the way that God loves And this is what Paul gets into in verse 2. If we were to ask the question, well, how do we do this? How do we imitate God? How are we to be imitators of the Most High? How are we to do this? He says in verse 2, and walk in love. Walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You see, we no longer as beloved children, walk like the Gentiles do, which we looked at last week in chapter four. Paul had a lot to say about how the Gentiles walk, those Gentiles being those outside of the people of God. He talks about how they walk with futility in their minds, darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, ignorant, hard-hearted, and calloused. 
This is how he describes the walk of the Gentiles. But not for us, not for you. If you are beloved of God, if he has poured his love into you, you, therefore, to imitate him well, walk in love. Paul does not leave this idea of love in the abstract. He does not give us permission to define love however we want to. We do that a lot, right? Real love is really how I like to receive love. My definition of love is what makes me feel good or what has made me feel good. It's not really a biblical definition of love. So Paul doesn't want us to be the ones defining the greatest attribute of God and his love. Rather, he says, this is what it looks like to walk in love, to imitate God. You follow the example of God in the flesh, in Christ. He says, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So to imitate God, to walk in love, is to follow the example of Jesus. He is the one we look to. And here's the really awesome thing about Jesus' love, is it's a love with a grip. It's a love with a weight to it. It's a love with, with some teeth. It's a love that you feel and experience. It's not just this kind of floaty idea of feeling good. Just read the Gospels. Everything Jesus does, he does in love. In love, Jesus rebukes our sin, just like he did with Peter, just like he did with the apostles, just like he did with the Pharisees and the prostitutes and the tax collectors. Love is not afraid to name sin what it is. In fact, that's one of the greatest expressions of love, is to say, this is wrong. I love you enough to tell you this is sin. The love of Christ rebukes our sin. But not only that, the love of Christ delights in our joy. The love of Christ is patient with our weakness. The love of Christ comforts us in our fear. When the worries of this world overwhelms us, the love of Christ gives us peace. The love of Christ is faithful toward us even when we are complete cowards. He is faithful to us even when we are weak cowards living faithlessly before him. The love of Christ died for us, even when we were the ones who deserved to die. You see, the love with which Christ loved us is so powerful, so magnificent, so astounding, that its strength was demonstrated most clearly when he hung on that cross. This is the love that we are to walk in, We are to love one another well, to follow the example of Christ. We are to rebuke sin with one another. We are to celebrate and rejoice with one another. We are to be patient with one another. We are to be faithful with one another. And this love is manifested so consistently in Christ that we are to love one another from the highest joys of life all the way down to death. This is what it looks like to be an imitator of God. We love people. Not when it's easy, Not when it's convenient, not when it just makes the mood better. We love one another all the way to the point of death. Love has no no greater expression than when someone would die for their friends. This is love. This is how we walk in love. We follow the example of Christ. And Paul says after that that it, it is like a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We are to follow Christ's example, who gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In the Levitical system, there were many different offerings that had the smoke going up, and when the smoke would go up, it says that God would breathe it in, and it would be a pleasurable smell to him. Paul says, I am pouring my life out like a drink offering. Jesus himself was an offering that pleased God. Our lives are not only to love our neighbors, but it is also to love God. This is the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's essentially what verse 2 is all about. 
We are to love one another as Christ loved us. And we are to love God in our lives should be poured out like a drink offering, like a grain offering, like an ascension offering that goes up and is pleasing, glorifying to the Father. To walk in love, to imitate God, to love one another, and to bring glory to God is our calling as sons and daughters of the Most High. However, our hearts are prone to wander. And that sounds great, but it's not that easy. In fact, many of you would say, even today I have already messed up loving one another. And certainly by the end of the day, whether it's in word, thought, or deed, you will fall short, as will I, of walking in love as Christ walked in love. So what are we to do when our hearts are so prone to wander? Though we desire to walk in love, angerness and bitterness just constantly are stirring right there under the surface. We desire to speak with love, but our words are so often seasoned with sarcasm, filthiness, foolishness, and it seeks to destroy rather than build up. What are we to do? Well, Paul addresses this as he goes on, and he gives us in the next four verses some examples of what it looks like to not walk in love in case there's any ambiguity, which there's lots of ambiguity in our lives, which we will see. Paul addresses that as well. Look with me uh, at, at verse 3. This is what it looks like to not walk in love. It says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. You see, if we are to imitate God, if we are to walk as a child of God, if we are a beloved child of God and we are to love God and love others, we cannot imitate God well while also entertaining sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness. How can we imitate God while at the same time being covet? or coveting our neighbor's possession or our neighbor's whatever? How can we be longing for something that doesn't come from the hand of God while at the same time imitating God? Do we ever see God acting that way? No. How can we truly imitate God when our lives are full of impurities where he is completely holy? We must be aware of these things, that we cannot imitate God while living in sexual immorality. For they are opposed to one another. He goes on in 4 through 6. He says, Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Right? Use your words. Your words are a gift of God. Don't let it be crude joking. Don't let it be immoral speech. Don't let it be foolish talk. Instead, use your words for thanksgiving. Be thankful for what God has done. Verse 5, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who, se- who, who is sexually immoral or impure who, or who is covetousness, that is isn't an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God or a kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. See, Paul knows well that when we allow, <coughs> excuse me, When we allow sin to reside in us unattended to, what tends to happen is there is a corrosion and dismantling and a destroying of our ability to walk in love. We cannot imitate God and walk in love when we are letting sin continue to fester and work throughout our speech and actions and thoughts. When sin is allowed to flourish in our lives, we become like those. <clears throat> we become like those without God. They are easily deceived. <coughs> Excuse me. When sin is left to flourish, we end up entertaining it. We get confused about what is true, what is good, what is right. When sin is allowed to be manifested and reside in our lives, we become used to thinking that what God loves is really not all that lovely 
And what God hates is really actually not all that bad. And we end up becoming deceived. We end up confusing what is true, what is real. We end up thinking like the Gentiles who are darkened in their understanding and futile in their minds. Ignorant, he says. Like them, we become callous to what is true and what is wrong. When sin is left unattended, it affects our ability to discern the good, the true, and the beautiful. And we lead or become deceived. So what do we do? Paul says in verse 7, Therefore, do not become partners with them. Avoid them. Avoid the people who are wanting to deceive you. Avoid those who are uh, living their lives as the Gentiles do, walking away from God. Avoid those who would seek to entice you into their values and their thinking. This word, do not partner with them, it's, it's not, it has nothing to do with friendship. It has nothing to do with conversations or being good neighbors or being a good witness or even working together. This word has this idea of if they're driving a car going somewhere, don't get in the car and go with them, right? It's to share in their thoughts. It's to share in their values. It's to share in their directions. Or if you're driving the car and you want to invite them into the car, don't let them grab the steering wheel because they will then take it where they want to go. Don't partner with them in this way. Don't go where they want to take you. So the goal in these situations is to not get in the car and I'll just get out before it's too late. Before we drive off the cliff, I will jump out. He said, no, don't even, don't even partner with them. Don't, don't share in these things with them. Don't live the way they are living. For their destination is not toward the light of the gospel, but it is toward the darkness of sin. Paul then says in verse eight, for at one time you were darkness. You were the one driving that car. You were the one that was completely deceived, fumbling around, unable to see. You were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Live your lives not in the darkness, but as children of light. What I like about this verse is the wording is a little bit different. This light and dark theme is prevalent throughout Paul's writings in Colossians. He talks about how he transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. See, uh, if, if you walk in sin, the light is not in you. John talks about this quite a bit in 1 John. But this is different. The way Paul words it here, look, look at this even in, in the English, and it makes sense. For at one time, you were darkness. Right? He doesn't say, at one time you were deceived by darkness. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, at one time you walked in the darkness. He doesn't say that. Though those themes are true in other texts, right? That's not that that is wrong. That's just not what he's saying here. You were darkness. But now, you are light in the Lord. You were darkness, and now you are light. See, what God has done in Christ is to take darkness and transform it into light. And this is what God does, and he begins in Genesis. This is new creation language here. Genesis 1, what does it say? But that the darkness was over the face of the deep. It was there. It was thick. There was no light. And what does God do? He speaks. And what happens to the darkness? It's gone. And light came in. It's like when you walk into a room, and the room is completely dark, and then you turn on a light. What happens? What we don't see is light and dark wrestling with each other on the walls, trying to see who's going to win. Right? We don't see this battle of light and dark trying to say, how about we compromise and we just, we're dim. <laughs> right? And you have the light on, but you can still kind of bump into things. That, that's, that's not what's going on here. See, the power of the gospel, what Jesus does, what God does, is he takes darkness and makes it into light. But that light does not exist just anywhere. What does, what does Paul say? He says, you are now light 
in the Lord. In the Lord. He has brought us, taken that which was dark, and he has brought it into himself, and things that are brought into himself are transformed into light. We are now children of light, and we are to walk as such. We are not to walk as deceived darkness, nor should we walk in the darkness, but we walk as light, as children of light. Christ has fundamentally changed his people. He has transformed his people. He has saved us from the darkness of sin and slavery to sin and has brought us into the light of the freedom in Christ. Paul is saying that this transformation is at its core of who we are in Christ. You were once darkness, now you are light. Keeping with that creation theme, Paul does say in 2 Corinthians, you are now therefore new creations in Christ. You are a new creation, a creation of light. Therefore, as children of light, as new creations in Christ, we are to live differently. We are to imitate something else. We are to walk in a different path. We are to walk as children of light. And then the fruit of this light is found in all that is good and right and true. Look at verse 9 and 10. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good, right, and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So again, he's fleshing out for us more and more what it means to imitate God, to be imitators of God. We are, as imitators of God, not darkness, but light, for God is light. And now we are to walk in light. We are to walk as children of light. And what does it look like to do that? Well, the fruit of light, the works, the, the, the product of the hands of those who are light, what we create are those things that are good and true. But not only that, good, right, and true, but not only that, he says this, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. This verse, I was talking to, to Mandy about this, and, and Zach, I talked to a bunch of people because I really like this verse. Um, you know, I've, I've read Ephesians many times, and this, this time, this phrase really just jumped out at me. Paul just tells us, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Now, that seems very easy just to read over that. But this is, this is what those who imitate God do. We take hold of our entire lives, our thoughts, our motivations, our feelings, our friendships, our finances, our jobs, our conflicts, our pains, our struggles, our temptations. We take hold of it. And we look at it, and we turn it, and look at it from different angles. And what do we try to do? We try to discern what is pleasing to God. It's the most simple thing. That's why I like it. It's so simple. What are we to do in our lives? Try to discern what is pleasing to God. If this is what you do in situations, then you are on your way to walking faithfully as an imitator of God. Try to discern. See, we're naturally prone to discern what is pleasing to, to us, it, take, it doesn't take long at all for me to discern a situation and what's good for me in this situation. That, that's easy. What takes time is to hit pause and try to discern what is pleasing to God. What am I to do when I'm raising my kids? What am I to do in my marriage? What am I to do in my job and with my difficult neighbors? I don't know. Try to discern what is pleasing to God. That's what you do. Paul has all of this really great and powerful symbolism of light and dark and, and, and creation and being imitators and ascension offerings that go up to be a fragrant smell to God. He has all of this wonderful language. And right here in the middle of it, he just tells us, try to discern what is pleasing to God. This is what we are to do. As children of light, we, we try to discern what is pleasing to God. No matter the situation, all things, relational conflict, opportunity in, in our careers, time, money, words, feelings, all of these things, we put on the altar and we try to discern what is pleasing to God. 
and this process of discerning what is pleasing to God becomes clearer as we continue to imitate him. That discerning process becomes easier, becomes more second nature for those who are mature in Christ. These are the men and the women that we should seek to imitate as they imitate God. So Paul continues to develop this light and dark theme in these next couple verses. Look at 11 through 14. He says this, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. All right? Take no part in these things. Because if you are discerning what is pleasing to God, you, you're not going to live there. If you want to please God, that is. If you want to walk in love, if you want to be an imitator of God, take no part in, in what's going on in these unfaithful works of darkness. But instead, expose them. Another great verse, right? We don't hide from them as if they don't exist. But if we live as light, we expose darkness. Now, this does not mean that we pull the curtains back on all of the horrible things that are going on in the world. I mean, Paul says in the next verse that the things that go on uh, in verse 12, it says, for it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. Right? So he's not saying that we highlight and expose all of the things that are done in secret. And there have been many efforts to do that in our culture. And what happens? We just change verbiage and we change ideas and say, oh, well, we're okay with that. We're happy that it's finally out. For there is a shamelessness with that. But rather, we expose them by living according to the truth, by walking as children of light. For we are light, and light exposes darkness. As we see in verse 13, he says, But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For when the light, that is, which is pleasing to God, those things that are good, right, and true, when those things are happening and being cultivated in our lives and in our families and in our neighborhoods and churches and governments and so on, it begins to expose the vileness of the darkness. It begins to point fingers and say, there's nothing there. This is empty. This is pointless. This is worthless. This is how we are to live according to the light, to expose that which is dark. And when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, visible for all to see. And then in verse 14, he goes, he goes on, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is how the gospel goes out is the light of the gospel continues to grow and advance. And wherever that light shines upon, people will become transformed by it. And awake, O oh sleeper, you're sleeping, it's dark, you wake up, and the light of Christ will shine upon you, and the kingdom of God advances. So as light, we are to live our lives in such a way that stands in a stark contrast and thus exposing the lies of the darkness. One of the main ways we do this is by telling the truth. If we are men and women who are willing to imitate God and tell the truth, so many of the dark spider webs of gossip and prayer requests and sharing with one another that leads to lies and deceit and hurt and division which separates people and destroys people. If we are just men and women who speak the truth, it doesn't matter who says what. Mark Twain once said, um, if you speak the truth, you never have to remember anything, <laughs> right? If you always speak the truth, you don't have to remember anything. You don't have to remember, what did I say to this person? And oh yeah, we were talking about that person, but now I'm talking to this person. And all of a sudden we just get wrapped up into this dark web of deceit and we are unable to shine forth the gospel. Just be Tellers of the truth live in the truth, for the truth sets us free from darkness. If you want to discern what God is saying about the situation that you are dealing with, if you want to discern what is pleasing to the Lord in this situation, tell the truth. That's the first step. That is pleasing to God in this situation. See it for what it is and call it what it is. Tell the truth, for the truth will indeed set us free. Paul finishes up this section in verses 15 through 17 
as he talks about wisdom. He kind of shifts to this proverbial tone. He says, look carefully in verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, right? Walk carefully. Be aware of what's going on here. Take hold of the situation and submit it to God. Walk with wisdom, making the best use of the time for the days, uh, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is the third time in this passage he has told us, pause, understand what, what, what God wants. No, understand what the will of the Lord is. Be in the word of God. Think the way that God thinks. Imitate God. We cannot imitate someone if we don't know what his will is. We don't know what his character is. We don't know what he would do in a situation. It is difficult to imitate that person. You cannot do it. We must know God in order to imitate God. So Paul says, know what the will of the Lord is is i like it how in in verse 15 he says look carefully how you walk this word carefully isn't like hey be careful there might be danger but rather it's talking about look accurately look exactly precisely at the way that you walk look with your eyes wide open of what's really going on in your life the way you're living your wives don't be or your lives don't be deceived look carefully exactly precisely Know what's going on in your life. And when we do this, we make the best use of the time. And we walk in wisdom. Paul goes on in the last few verses, 18 through 21. He says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. That word debauchery is a good word. We should use it more often. You know, the the Greek word for that is um, sozia, which comes from sozo, which is the word salvation. You're saved, and then you put the awe, which negates it, like awe theist is theist, theos, God. Awe is no God, if we're an atheist, is someone who doesn't believe in God. Debauchery is awe, so zia, no salvation. So if you get drunk, you're actually living like someone who has no salvation. Don't do that. Don't live that way. Don't abuse gifts of God. Do not become drunk with wine, for that is as if you're not even saved. That is debauchery. But instead, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual song, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 20 says that we are to give thanks to the Lord always and for everything. Give thanks always. And for everything, this is the posture of one who imitates God, one who is light, one who has been brought from darkness to light. We are men and women who just exude gratitude to God. If we're not thankful, if we don't have gratitude to God, then we don't really understand what he's done for us. He has taken you, if your faith is in Christ and You believe in him. He has taken you from the darkest pits of sin and despair and slavery that will have an eternal effect. And he has brought you because of nothing you have done. You didn't earn this. You You weren't smart enough for this. Your heart wasn't pure enough to choose this. He grabbed you out of that and brought you into himself and transformed you into light. And now every situation in our life As we walk in the light, we should be thanking God. We should just thank him day in and day out, for he is so good. And his graces that he has poured upon us and the faithfulness that he would actually continue to hold on to us, even when we know what is right and we choose to do what is wrong. The fact that he's faithful to us and he holds on to us and continues to draw us to himself, what do we have to not give thanks for? everything in our lives, including the struggles, including the pain. He uses these things to form us into himself. How did Christ love us? We talked about it at at verse one, all the way to the point of death. He was tortured, he was mocked, he was betrayed. He lost his friends, he lost his family. He was even abandoned by God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
He did that out of love. So our love toward one another and our love toward God and the struggles that come into our lives are all forming us into the image of this Christ, this one we are to imitate, who went into the darkest depths of hell in order to redeem us. We should be thankful when things are hard because we know he's preparing us for the resurrection that is to come. This is what our God has done for us. Therefore, we should imitate him. And we do so knowing we are beloved children. We are to walk in wisdom, walk in truth, walk in light. Be militant in your thinking, right? Be militant. Don't become lazy or passive in our thinking. Don't let ideas just happen to you. Be wise, take hold of something and look at it and discern, how can I please God in this? Be active thinkers, be active in our lives, lest we become deceived and be led into the shadows of darkness. We are to truly seek to discern what is pleasing to the Lord and see and seek to understand what the will of the Lord is in all things. And as we do this, we walk as children of light, imitating our Father who is light. Amen? Let's pray.